why the nature of this dark matter, uh, we need to rediscover the phenomenon through some other type of channel, some other type of probe, uh, simply because gravity is universal and does not allow us uh, to, to uh, distinguish uh, among the many possible logical possibility of what this could be. Uh, and the ugly part, uh, which is not um, uh, often mentioned, but I'd like to mention it, is that uh, uh, we know as a proof of principle that there are uh, candidates for dark matter which cannot be detected but gravitationally, okay? So we know a priori that the dark matter identification quest admits virtually untestable solutions, be at least not beyond the level of gravitational probes that we have uh, today. So we must hope in a certain sense that the dark matter phenomenon admits some other handles and can be rediscovered through some other uh, way. And in particular, indirect dark matter detection basically uh, amounts to remotely sensing some effects of say annihilation products or decay products of dark matter, which can tell us something about the dark matter nature. Okay, so uh, uh, what are these the, the contours of this bet? As I said, it's a bet because we are not guaranteed uh, uh, that that there is a, 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 a result at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so let me illustrate the contours of the bet with the simplest example, which is by the no in, in no way unique. Uh, and does not uh, exhaust all possibilities, of course. Uh, the traditional link between dark matter and particle physics that you may have heard about uh, uh, basically goes back to, say, maybe the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s, uh, uh, when uh, after the, 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 the finalization of the, uh, of the standard model, at least from the theoretical point of view, uh, many physicists uh, uh, started wondering um, uh, if there shouldn't be new physics at the TV scale. Uh, and uh, in particular, in order to cure the so-called hierarchy problem. And so explaining in a natural way uh, why the weak scale, in particular the Higgs mass, uh, uh, is, so, is so low and why it's insensitive to say uh, gravity uh, scale or whatever new physics scale uh, uh, is out there at energies much larger than uh, the TV. And the conjecture was that there is some sort of project, uh, protective uh, uh, symmetry uh, that uh, shields low energy phenomena from high energy ultraviolet scale. And the best candidate was, of course, supersymmetry. Uh, now, uh, there were also other indications that would favor a link with, with, with um, uh, TV scale and dark matter. And this is the fact that precision data didn't show any evidence for this new uh, type of physics. So uh, it's better to avoid direct coupling of the standard model, standard model to BSM as illustrated in the, in the left diagram here uh, between the standard model in blue and, uh, and the new physics in red. And then some sort of say uh, uh, parity-like symmetry, uh, uh, which would only allow the production of new particles in pair uh, would greatly help in, in reducing the tension between the null searches and the hypo uh, hypothetical new particles. It has also other benefits, as such as making uh, um, uh, the proton more easily stable or fulfill the, 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 the constraints of, uh, on proton decay in grand unified scenarios. Uh, uh, one consequence of these scenarios is that the lightest new particle, uh, 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 which, is opposite, which has thus opposite parity under this this symmetry is automatically stable. So uh, just by this line of argument, which has nothing to do with cosmology, uh, many physicists around say early eighties were ready to accept the possibility that there were new particles, some of which in particular, at least one of which uh, at say TV or hundred GV scale uh, stable, okay? Or very, very long lived. Now, what happens if you add this, this uh, speculation to the standard uh, cosmological model? So let's add uh, a new particle with weak scale interaction, uh, relatively heavy, say hundreds of GeV, uh, uh, to the cosmic plasma. Okay. Now we know uh, from the standard cosmological uh, scenario that the early universe was was a hot plasma, where all thermally allowed uh, degrees of freedom were populated, and this has been tested through Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the existence indirect hints for the existence of the cosmological neutrino backgrounds up to temperature of MeV. OK, if you extrapolate this back further, say a GeV temperature or tens of GeV, uh, the addition of these new species would make uh, now uh, uh, a, a new particle thermally produced in the plasma. And this uh, particle would be uh, uh, basically uh, would, would preserve a constant density per co-moving volume uh, as long as it's relativistic. 
Uh, but when dropping, uh, when the temperature drops uh, to, to a fraction of the mass of this new particle, uh, uh, just because of Boltzmann suppression, this particle would suffer an exponential suppression and uh, uh, eventually would decouple from the rest of the plasma. How much of these particles is left depends on how strongly the particle is coupled to the plasma. The stronger the coupling, the longer it's, it's, it's in equilibrium, and so uh, the, the more suppressed its abundance is because you, you move uh, further in the Boltzmann tail, okay, as shown in this, in this plot. So this is a textbook calculation by now, but uh, it, it yielded a, a remarkable results, namely that in order to reproduce the, 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 the measurements, the amount of dark matter that one observes, uh, you would need something like an electroweak coupling uh, for a particle mass of the order of, say, 200 GeV. This is sometimes dubbed as WIMP miracle, but uh, this has been at the basis for of several decades of uh, uh, strong motivations to search for uh, these particles in a number of ways. Uh, which ways? Here is a one, one slide summary of these strategies, either by trying to look for the byproducts of these WIMP's annihilations, uh, uh, and this is basically a sort of uh, mimicking what happens in the early universe. And so we might look for the byproducts of this annihilation in, 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 in uh, uh, environments where the density is sufficiently high that this rate is appreciable. Or you can read this diagram from right to the left and so try to produce these pairs of particles, of course, plus something else against which to measure the recoil uh, uh, in a collider or read it uh, uh, um, from top down or down up, and so uh, uh, use them as a scatter uh, uh, um, against uh, targets of the standard model in underground detectors. So the whole program was to, to demonstrate the particle physics nature of this astrophysical dark matter, for instance, locally with direct detection or remotely with indirect detection, and then create uh, 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 these particles, if possible, in colliders, measuring some properties and checking if the pro properties that you infer on Earth are compatible or coherent at least with the properties that you might infer uh, in astrocosmo environments. Okay. Uh, more specifically, the indirect dark matter uh, uh, search focuses on this uh, uh, left to right type of arrow and also uh, relies on the combination of different final states. You see here photons, neutrinos, maybe uh, part, uh, antiparticles such as uh, positrons or antiprotons, and uh, 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 combining this information from different channels and accounting, of course, for some modifications of the spectra uh, uh, that you have uh, uh, at the emission with respect to what you can detect at the Earth because of propagation effects or, for instance, absorption if the medium is not fully transparent. Uh, so that's the program. And how do you realize the program uh, experimentally? Well, uh, uh, you have plenty of opportunities to, to realize it with a number of different probes. Here is a, 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 a few snapshots of, the, uh, of some of the instruments that have been used. At the top center, you see the Fermi uh, uh, satellite uh, hosting um, uh, the, 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 uh, the LAT telescope, which is a telescope in GEV. Uh, range of gamma rays that produces map as the one that you see at the top uh, right. Uh, you can use the CMB itself, you see at the top uh, left the anisotropy map from Planck. Uh, you can use neutrinos uh, as uh, in the ice cube telescope in the center uh, left. You can use cosmic ray detectors on balloons or on uh, in space. Uh, here you see, I think it's CREAM and uh, uh, AMS uh, on board uh, the International Space Station. And then you can have other types of probes. Uh, uh, these in radio, here I'm just uh, picturing the edges uh, uh, instrument you might have heard about. So each of these channels has its own advantages, problems, challenges, and so on and so forth. Uh, all of them have been used and, uh, and useful for, for telling us something uh, uh, about dark matter. I cannot review them all, uh, but let me give you a synoptic bound uh, plot uh, of what are roughly the current uh, reach uh, in this annihilation cross-section uh, versus mass plane for different type of experiments and for different final states. Uh, you see in particular uh, adronic final states in, in red, uh, uh, gauge, uh, weak gauge boson in, in blue, and leptonic final states in green. And you see, uh, uh, in particular, extremely competitive uh, uh, constraints from the CMB, from antiprotons in the AMS, from gamma ray uh, in Fermi, and then also some interesting constraints from, from, from uh, uh, neutron telescopes. Uh, uh, but overall, you see that we are probing roughly the 100 GeV 
uh, regime for this thermal cross-section obeying these simple arguments uh, that I was um, uh, explaining before. Uh, there has been no firm detection till now, uh, but basically these instruments have, de have been delivering what we expected, namely to probe this uh, window beam parameter space. Now, uh, uh, the, 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 the two line summary is that there is no detection, uh, only bounds, uh, but there are a number of claims of hints uh, of possible signals of dark matter. Unfortunately, none of these signals in indirect detection has been confirmed in an independent channel. Okay, uh, and so, and all of these admit alternative astrophysical hypotheses or maybe instrumental origins. So uh, we cannot, we are not at the stage to claim a, a discovery. But it's interesting to analyze a little bit further why there are more and more uh, claims, if you wish, if you just read the literature on the archive every week, uh, you, might, you might read uh, uh, something about uh, these uh, hints of dark matter here, here and there. So let's analyze more globally why, why this is the case. Uh, uh, example of these claims may be the galactic center excess in GV gamma rays, uh, the positron anomaly from Pamela, uh, Fermi, and uh, uh, AMS, uh, the antiproton flattening at hundreds of GV in AMS, or a bump in antiprotons around 10, G, 10 15 GVs in AMS. Uh, and the, the, the reason why these claims or these hints are abounding uh, boils down to the fact that uh, of these two points, the two biggest problems that we have in indirect dark matter uh, identification, which are that we do not know the signal. And by, by this, I, mean, I don't mean that we cannot compute it in a given model. Of course, if we have a perturbative model, say a supersymmetric scenario, for instance, we can perform uh, calculations with some uh, predefined uh, um, degree of of uh, uh, precision. However, uh, uh, nobody will even believe, even the strongest believers in the SUSY scenarios for dark matter uh, are, are, are sure that none of the simplified scenarios uh, presented is an exact replica of what is realized in nature, right? So even within SUSY, uh, uh, the truth might lie in a model that has not been computed uh, yet. But more importantly, the background is only approximately known. And this is a particularly important uh, thing to remember when dealing with indirect dark matter detection. Uh, uh, this, we don't have the possibility as in, uh, 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 say, collider physics to go back to the lab and tune some of the parameters and understand better this background or maybe collect many more data. So we have to live with whatever nature gives us. Uh, in order to illustrate this, this uh, to, uh, to a broad audience, I try to use an analogy, okay? Uh, let's assume that in this hunt for dark matter, we believe that the signal of dark matter looks like a zebra, okay? This is a quite spectacular pattern with stripes, uh, black and white stripes, uh, four legs, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it doesn't look so uh, difficult to, to, to find some, some uh, animal like that. Let's assume also that we believe that the background looks like a giraffe. So uh, clearly there are some similarities. It has four legs, it's an herbivorous animal, but clearly there are also some differences like the color, the size, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what happens when you have a new experiment taking data, exploring a new window in parameter space? Uh, often, uh, this experiment uh, starts revealing some preliminary data uh, uh, that looks uh, tantalizingly uh, uh, similar to the signal of dark matter. So many groups, many people write papers about dark matter uh, discovery. However, the experiment keeps collecting more data. We have a better picture of the global uh, uh, environment and nature of these uh, sources. And eventually you realize that the, the, the beast that the experiment has revealed uh, is belonging to the class of the background, uh, but has some unexpected features that uh, uh, make it uh, surprisingly similar to the signal you might uh, uh, you were looking for. Okay, so this is not just a story. This has really happened in the case of the positron excess, in the case of GV gamma ray excess for the antiproton excess. Some of these are still debated as possible uh, through uh, dark matter uh, signals. However, in all these cases. Uh, uh, people have realized that there are alternatives and very plausible ones, such as uh, pairs of lepton pairs emitted from pulsar wind nebula and accelerated there, uh, uh, millisecond pulsar populations that may emit uh, gamma rays from the galactic center, yet unresolved ones, or maybe uh, some subtleties on the way you deal with, uh, with, an, with the background calculation in the antiprotons and also with the data analysis for instance, taking into account uh, correlation in the, uh, in the errors. 
Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is a very hard exercise, and I, I try to highlight why it, it, it is hard and why you have uh, this, why, why it is prone to, uh, to, to, to uh, claims of the existence of dark matter. And this is because of this background uh, um, uh, knowledge, which is very limited. And in fact, we discover the signal and new interesting astrophysical signals on the way uh, to our exploration. Uh, let me focus, however, on the road ahead. Where, where do we stand? What, what are we doing? And uh, what are our best hopes for the, for the, for the near future? Uh, uh, there are two broad attitudes in the community on how to search for dark matter and what to search for. Uh, loosely speaking, there is a first class of people, actually these might be the same people uh, uh, on different projects, but uh, uh, schematically, uh, uh, two classes of attitudes. One is to keep faith. Uh, so let's assume that our wimpy ideas were roughly correct and we were sort of unlucky. For instance, uh, the, the production, the, the mass threshold is a little bit higher than what we expected. So they are out of reach for production at say LHC, but maybe they are less than one order of magnitude heavier. So you have some multi-TV uh, particle, multi-TV scale, uh, rather than uh, multi-hundred GV scale. If this is the case, there is still hope to, uh, to detect these WIMPs with more or less traditional techniques. Uh, um, uh, or there might be some mild fine tunings, for instance, some compressed uh, mass spectrum, or some of the particles might be accidentally light and so uh, not really in the bulk of the parameter space explored by the experiments. Uh, the alternative hypothesis is that, in fact, this was a red herring, and the dark matter problem has nothing to do with TV scale uh, new physics. And the justification for the dark matter, both model building and searches, has to be found in some other piece of physics, let's say uh, the origin of neutrino masses or uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the puzzling strong CP problem, et cetera, et cetera. Or, forget about theoretical motivations, which are not been very useful till now, uh, and uh, just focus on some phenomenological aspects. Uh, there are some hints that maybe uh, 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 the core of uh, uh, virilized halos of dark matter do not behave the way we expect, uh, or there is maybe some satellite problems in galaxies such as the Milky Way. Uh, it's very hard to have a firm conclusion on these hints because there is complicated baryonic physics uh, entering these type of observations. We are very far from the linear regime, very clean channels I was talking about at the beginning. But uh, there might be possibilities that uh, these tell, tell us something about the departure of the uh, uh, observations from the simplest paradigm we have, uh, we have described. So uh, uh, these are the two classes of attitudes uh, I will briefly describe. But before doing that, let me uh, emphasize an important comment. Uh, uh, the indirect detection of dark matter is very, very far from a critical coverage, even for the simplest uh, WIMP uh, uh, models, okay? Uh, and some people that are becoming more and more pessimistic about uh, the WIMPs as an explanation for the dark matter phenomenon uh, are not basing the decision only on the results of indirect dark matter detection. It's rather the fact that we have no evidence whatsoever for a new physics scale at, the, uh, uh, at say, at the TV, uh, which is making people skeptical about this possibility, at least more skeptical than they used to be uh, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Uh, so the real um, uh, aspect, if you just focus from the point of view of an indirect dark matter uh, scientist, uh, uh, you should not be uh, pessimistic because of the uh, uh, results of these experiments. However, what is true is that we are facing more and more the challenge that the background knowledge uh, limits uh, the reach of exploration of parameter space. So we are more and more limited by the errors on the knowledge of the backgrounds rather than by the statistics. Okay, so uh, uh, the, the, to summarize this is that uh, it's fair to say that the return of our investment in indirect dark matter searches is shrinking. So you need to make many more efforts and to understand the background much better to gain only moderately in, 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 in parameter space. That said, we will take up, uh, advantage of what is planned uh, and what is all sometimes even existing for the, for the search of uh, dark matter in the traditional uh, candidates. Uh, one example is the case of dwarf spheroidals. These are satellites of the Milky Way with a very high dark matter to baryon content, which makes them rich in signal compared to the uh, uh, backgrounds which originate from star or uh, compact stars and all these related phenomena. Uh, 
even more, uh, uh, actually, even deeper reach in parameter space, you can obtain through uh, stacking techniques, okay? And it's not a surprise that the best current gamma ray limits come uh, from the investigation of these objects, okay? From the direction of these objects. Uh, now, coming surveys such as LSST, or actually the Vera Rubin uh, observatories, uh, should discover uh, hundreds of these new war spheroidals. Uh, okay, should increase by almost an order of magnitude what we currently know. Uh, and even if we assume that only 60 of these are suitable for determination of dark matter distribution, uh, in the plot that you see at the bottom left, uh, uh, you would you expect an improvement with respect to the current uh, bounds from Fermi, which is the solid black curve, by a factor of, say, three, four, uh, depending on the number and, and uh, uh, um, properties of the dwarf spheroidals that uh, that we will uh, discover. So uh, we can anticipate that even if we do nothing, even if we collect no new data uh, uh, on, say, gamma rays, uh, we will improve the current sensitivity. And eventually, we will become uh, background limited. Uh, uh, and so uh, it becomes more and more interesting from, at least for, for now, for the theoretical point of view, to investigate data-driven techniques rather than astrophysical model-driven techniques uh, in order to extract these constraints. And we recently, uh, uh, with some collaborators of mine, uh, we explored this in more uh, quantitative details and extended this attitude also to the determination of the dark matter distribution in these uh, dwarf spheroids. Of course, this doesn't mean that there won't be any new uh, uh, observatories. Say the CTA observatories will be a new window on the multi-TV uh, range. Uh, the ice cube will explore deeper the, the, the neutrino channel and so on and so forth. Uh, but what happens if the, the WIMPs are not the right answer? So uh, what happens if the, this alternative class of models uh, uh, is what we should expect for the dark matter? Uh, of course, we cannot give up on the idea that dark matter is metastable or stable for the simple reason that otherwise it won't be there anymore. And so we need it for, for even now at redshift zero to explain what we see. But we can easily get rid of the hypothesis that dark matter was once at the equilibrium with the, with the standard model particles in the early universe. So you tune your parameter, well, you tune, you just change your parameters to decrease the coupling. And what happens is that at the same point, at the same time, you get rid of uh, any possible signal at say LHC, because the same coupling now uh, is, is ruling the, 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 the probability of producing it in a, in a collision of say protons uh, and the probability of producing it in the early universe. Uh, but you now resort to alternative mechanism rather than the thermal uh, freeze out mechanism to produce it in the early universe. Okay, so it's not so difficult from the theoretical point of view to, uh, to solve this problem of the negative uh, observations. And if you now wonder where to search for dark matter, uh, well, as I briefly mentioned, the parameter space is huge. So just in terms of mass, I took here a, a diagram by, by Graciela Gelmini, you have uh, this huge parameter space with extremely uh, diverse uh, type of candidates from fuzzy dark matter that manifests quantum uh, aspects at macroscopic astrophysical scale to primordial black holes at the stellar mass scale, okay? Passing through ultralight bosons or such as axion-like particles, sterile neutrinos, or uh, MEB scale uh, like dark matter. So, uh, the, as you can imagine, these are very diverse, so no single strategy is good for all of them. Uh, but as a, uh, a generic pattern, uh, these are hardly um, um, the ideal candidates for collider searches. And when they are, uh, they usually require precision physics studies rather than, uh, you know, focusing on the energy frontiers. Uh, more, uh, more frequently, well, even for direct detection, either they, they have ad hoc direct detection, not the standard recoil type of uh, detect, de detectors in, in uh, uh, say, xenon or, or, or uh, silicon uh, or germanium-based detectors. Uh, they require ad hoc searches such as um, uh, cavity conversions for axion searches, for instance. But more frequently, they are prone to indirect uh, type of signals. Uh, one example is the X-ray line from the uh, sterile neutrino decays or astrophysical type of signals, uh, such as the ones associated to the um, uh, idea that uh, dark matter is in the form of primordial black holes, okay? Uh, one generic lesson is that the mass range broadens, okay? So you should not focus necessarily on the TV uh, mass scale. You can have easily 
uh, via the freezing mechanism, uh, dark matter, say in the 10 PV uh, scale, which are usually metastable. And maybe one way to look for this dark matter is to high energy neutrinos. Uh, there are some speculations that part or the totality of the flux of neutrinos observed by ice cube might be accounted by uh, this phenomenon. And uh, this is not yet uh, ruled out. And uh, um, a typical probe of this uh, might be the 100 TV uh, gamma ray uh, window, uh, which is accessible through uh, ground-based telescopes uh, like OAK or the forthcoming uh, LASSO. Or you can have sub-GV or MEV uh, scale, and uh, maybe this leaves some imprint, for instance, on the, on the um, cosmic microwave background spectral uh, shape or soft gamma ray uh, bands that are uh, yet to be uh, explored. Uh, um, a, a, as a general rule, when you don't know exactly where to look for, uh, uh, for dark matter, you should go for some unexplored window and that becomes of crucial importance. And one uh, very interesting example is provided by the opening of gravitational waves, okay? The, this new window in astrophysics. Uh, although the idea that primordial black holes make the, the bulk of the dark matter is almost ruled out, I say almost because there are still some windows in parameter space where this is uh, possible. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, the discovery of uh, black hole mergers and some of these black holes um, have unusual mass properties, at least unusual with respect to pre-existing models, uh, um, have uh, stimulated a, a revisitation in the community of a number of arguments and uh, bounds that were presented over the past decades. And some of these bounds have been proven to be uh, incorrect or, or uh, had to be uh, revisited. Uh, or maybe think of the impact that the, 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 the binary neutron star uh, observed through multi-messenger uh, tools, including gravitational waves, has had on the uh, modified gravity, okay? That was amazing. Uh, basically, it was uh, uh, highly restricting the, the, the parameter space of modified gravity theory, including dark matter emulators. So something that looks unrelated to this sector might host some uh, 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 important discovery. And I expect that similar type of uh, impact might, have, may, might come from the opening of the 21 centimeter uh, cosmology of the dark ages. Uh, so we are talking here of very long uh, radio waves or um, from the exploration in much greater, uh, uh, with much greater precision of the spectral shape of the CMB. Basically, we are still relying on the very old COBE virus uh, data. Uh, so here is my overview and conclusion. Uh, I, I, I review the traditional arguments for the linking the, the dark matter uh, in the form of WIMPs uh, to the uh, uh, new physics at the theory scale. I, I told you that there has been no discovery uh, yet. However, uh, the experiment have reached an imp a, a, a meaningful uh, uh, diagnostic power. They are digging into interesting uh, parameter space. Uh, there will be improvements uh, along this uh, path. Even if we do nothing, there will be improvements, but there will be dedicated instruments that, that well, not dedicated to dark matter, but dedicated to, to some particular uh, range of energies and channels like, uh, like CTA for TEV gamma rays uh, that will uh, definitely improve the situation. Uh, uh, but we should expect in the coming decade or two, a reduced uh, return over investment. On the other hand, uh, there is a, a burst of activity in, in uh, uh, non-thermal alternative dark matter candidates, and uh, they, they find motivation either uh, in alternative theory or in purely phenomenological uh, and uh, um, observational uh, reasons. And I try to justify with some examples why it's extremely important uh, uh, when you don't know exactly where to search for it to open new windows. I mentioned the MEV gamma ray sky, the gravitational waves, 21 centimeter, the spectral distortion in CMB, but also improved X-ray sensitivity. That would be crucial. Uh, having a large field of view uh, uh, instrument with, with very good uh, spectroscopic resolution uh, or the 100 TV uh, window of galactic astrophysics. And there might be some related uh, direct detection uh, uh, searches, for instance, in the light mass frontier or even for collider physics, there might be some ad hoc type of uh, uh, searches, uh, for instance, metastable progenitors, displaced vertices, invisible Higgs decays. These are all worth uh, uh, looking at. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pascal, for a very nice overview. Uh, it was very interesting to 
uh, get an update on how we stand on the dark matter problem. Uh, uh, particularly for me as a cosmologist, this is one of the most important uh, questions that uh, face us as we build a standard model. So if there are questions, uh, please raise your hand and I'll... Uh... Okay, Rohini. Rohini, can you? Uh, I can't hear you, Rohini. Very far away. Ah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, Pasquale, thank you for a very nice talk. But uh, I wanted to ask uh, you one question. You made a statement uh, that uh, the people's uh, the sort of uh, people are getting uh, fed up with uh, WIMP and trying to ready to get give it up because of the lack of uh, uh, evidence for any uh, TV scale physics. But don't you think that the direct detection experiments also have had something to do with the sort of people getting the 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 wimp miracle or wimp idea yes. getting under pressure uh, well yeah i mean this is not a, a, a purely scientific question right this is mostly a sociological type a of bit, question but uh, some scientific but, a little bit so scientific. I, I i cannot talk for for people whom i not i do not necessarily share the the attitude with but but uh, i i have this impression yes both direct detection negative results and uh, collide null results of for new physics at colliders contribute to this attitude however i try to emphasize if you just stick to the data that we have from indirect detection uh, that's not a fully justified uh, uh, approach, okay? So uh, uh, just like we should not have believed that blindly in, in WIMPs 10 years ago, we should not reject this uh, candidate now because we still have to probe some uh, important... No, 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 that I, that I take with. I, I was saying but, that to me, yeah, 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 probably, direct yes. detection experiments were putting much more pressure on, uh, on the WIMP, uh, independent yes. of what yes. physics, what model I will have. That's yes, the point yes. that I wanted to make. But but then but then uh, yeah I, I mean there there are some aspects for me the collider search is a little bit more generic okay and the reason is that the collider is not sensitive to dark matter it's just sensitive to the qualitative idea that you have new physics at the, at that scale. Uh, which is accessible. So maybe with some strongly interacting partners or maybe with sufficiently light charged particles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for direct detection, uh, yes, but maybe, you know, maybe uh, the whole picture is correct and you have some WIMP-like relic, but this is only 1% of the dark matter. And that would not invalidate the existence of new physics at the electronic okay, okay, scale. Okay, okay, that I agree. Uh, but with the, for cosmologists would be irrelevant or almost irrelevant, right? So um, I, I, I'm, I have a more mitigated attitude on, on that. So I, I still think that the collider and the direct searches uh, have sort of hit different points uh, in, 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 the, in the belief space, okay? But um, yeah, I, I still continue Thank doing research on both aspects, okay? Okay, <laughs> same, same here, Next. same here. Next, uh, I'd like to uh, invite Gagan Mohanty for his question, and then uh, we will right. start. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, very well. Yeah, so thank you for a very nice talk. So I would like to start where Rohini left. So in your last slide, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do I understand correctly, like um, between the two, uh, you have this, um, uh, you know, the, the wimpy like uh, scenario versus the, yeah. the non thermal, you know, the alternative scenarios. So, um, as an experimentalist, uh, you know, if you could tell me, like, is it the wimpy like scenario is really like the way I understand reduced incremental return over investment is really now in a uh, difficult uh, parameter space. Um, uh, on the other hand, the alternatives are something we should uh, try to explore more. Or, or is there something you can think of something like a litmus litmus test for the WIP-like scenario? Like let's say for the Higgs, I mean, you know, once you have 125 GB Higgs, 
all the Higgs less theory are, are gone, right? So is there something from the experimental point of view we can have for the wimpy like scenario to completely, uh, if it is not possible, then of course, uh, you know, we sort, sort of give up at some stage and then we think of alternative. So can you please tell your uh, sort of opinion about WIMP versus the non wimp so my my, my opinion. This is just my opinion. So it does not. Right. Uh, uh, my opinion is that I mean we should explore the electroweak scale independently of dark matter and all that means. So uh, uh, and this has to be done especially via collider uh, probes. Uh, that said, uh, there will be experiments improving on the search for dark matter at that scale independently of the fact that we are optimistic or not about it. So the example of CTA is a good example. So none of these experiments in indirect dark matter searches is explicitly built for dark matter. It's an astrophysical observatory of some sort, typically. So uh, th this is a sort of a free lunch. Uh, we can improve in our search with experiments which have dark matter typically among their secondary uh, targets, uh, but they are not designed to do dark matter search only. That's for indirect dark matter det detection. And this is a big advantage for indi indirect dark matter detection. So none of the experiments I showed you, Fermi, AMS, or Ice Cube, et cetera, is a failure. Very contrary, I mean, these are extremely successful experiments, but none of these has detected dark matter, right? So uh, concerning your question on where an experiment should, should go, I think now it's a matter of personal taste. So there is, there is work for, for both type of attitudes. Either you love the challenge of you know, uh, uh, pushing your understanding of backgrounds to the, to the next level, uh, and so you move towards some sort of precision astrophysics that might be in the, in the, in the, in the soul of some of the uh, experimentalists out there. And then there is a more type of exploratory uh, type of uh, uh, experimentalist. Okay, you want to play with new types of detector for the MEV range, maybe based on new uh, solid state type of uh, effects. And that's another window which is open. And now I would say, now you have the opportunity of being uh, funded. Okay, and it was much, much harder 20 years ago to get up with, a, uh, to, to raise a new idea and have a realistic chance to get it funded. Now you have some arguments to defend it. And there is also some R&D associated with this. So most of these efforts won't pay off in terms of dark matter by definition. Uh, you won't find 10 different types of dark matter, uh, but uh, uh, they will pay off in terms of R&D for a number of detectors in say, uh, low noise, uh, low background type of searches. So I, I, I encourage both direction, uh, but probably that's not the same type of work for both type of searches. Huh? Thank you very much. Uh, Vivek Tatar. Yeah, uh, my question uh, relates to the possibility of uh, looking for sterile neutrinos uh, mm -hmm. in the mass range, let's say one EV onwards. Uh, mm -hmm. In let's say, uh, uh, spallation neutron source like uh, environments. Uh, you use coherent neutrino scattering to look for this. Are, do you know of any experiments that are looking for, uh, you know, such, uh, os, you know, searches? Uh, okay, uh, so I, I th I'm not the, the 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 greatest experts of uh, neutrino experiments, although I've worked a little bit in that, but. Um, Actually, we should separate the search for electrovolt scale new neutrinos, sterile neutrinos, from dark matter searches. Okay, there is a there is a deep reason for that, and it's if the dark matter is a fermion, uh, then there is a lower bound on the mass of the dark matter that just comes from phase space hard, uh, so it's very robust. Uh, so basically, related to the fermionic nature, it's the Gantt remain bound, which basically tells us that the dark matter cannot be lighter than roughly a keV. Okay, so uh, it, it is possible that you have new sterile neutrino states of electron volts, maybe tens of electron volts, but this would not be the dark matter we know already. Uh, it could be a subdominant hot dark matter component. And then concerning the experiments that search for these type of states, well, I know that there are many searches at reactors uh, through uh, spectral type of measurements uh, related also to oscillation uh, claims of uh, anomalies in this range. Uh, but there are also experiments such as the Catherine, uh, the tritium endpoint experiment is also sensitive to the existence of uh, sterile neutrinos of say uh, electron volt uh, or 10 of electron volt uh, range. 
maybe the ones that you measure on coherent, uh, uh, they, they also contribute. I'm not very familiar with, with the reach of this experiment in this parameter space. But for dark matter searches, we should look at multi KV from KV onwards. And that's why I was mentioning X-ray type of searches from the decay of neutrino into an active neutrino plus uh, an X-ray photon. Uh, and maybe you have some parameter space at, you know, future uh, beam dump type of experiments that is still uh, accessible at the MEV range. Uh, this is my the best of my understanding on this on this field. Okay. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, I think we should move on now to the next speaker. Uh, Thank you. And uh, thanks a lot for your lovely overview, Pascal. Uh, this next speaker is Professor Luciano Rezola. He is going to talk about the first image of a black hole. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a very exciting uh, uh, window that has opened up and uh, look forward to Luciano explaining it to us. Uh, over to you, Luciano. Okay, hi, thank you, everyone. So I hope you can hear me well. Um, yes. Okay, so thank you for the, the kind invitation. I will now share my screen, of course, you know, this is just a shadow of the talk I would like uh, to give, um, <laughs> or would have liked to give if we were in presence, but um, nevertheless, I'll try and, and do my best. So I hope you can see my screen. Yes. I'll try to make this a little bit smaller and move it away from where it might. Okay, so um, as the title goes, I'm, telling, I'm going to tell you about the first image of a black hole. And in particular, this is the plan of my talk. I will try to explain what is it we've done in terms of looking at M87 star. And then I'll try to split my talk into two parts and I'll, I will not give the first part. Um, so I will give a very um, brief description of how you actually take a, a picture of a black hole from an observational point of view. But this is because uh, I invite you to follow Shep Doleman's talk on Friday at 1720 uh, IST. And instead, what I will do is I will concentrate on what is closer to my work, which is actually the, the, the theoretical aspect of this. And time permitting, I will um, try to uh, tell you a little bit about thoughts we've been having about alternatives to Einstein and to black holes. So, um, what is it we've done? Um, this is, um, you know, nowadays you can't say you're doing any serious science if you don't have a fancy Hollywood type movie that uh, um, just describes what you've done. So that's, we, we, you know, we've done very serious science. So we have a very uh, serious Hollywood type movie, which is what I'm going to show now. I hope you will also hear the music. So essentially we look at the Virgo cluster, okay? And in the Virgo cluster, there is a, a, a galaxy, M87. This is the biggest gas galaxy in the cluster and was known, you know, so since a long time, actually so long ago that the little filament that you can see sticking out of it was once thought to be a comet. So this was actually thought to be a comet. Now we know that this filament that you will start seeing now is, is not a comet, it's actually an ultra relativistic jet coming out from somewhere at the center of the galaxy. And what we've done is use a technique called the LBI to go deep down into the center. And uh, that's what came out of our observations. So we believe this is the first image of a black hole. And now we'll try to explain how this was accomplished. So as a matter of fact, the technique we use is called the LBI, very long baseline interferometry, and is not a new technique. We just used it to, um, you know, uh, we brought it to the uh, state of the art, well beyond the state of the art. And um, a, a single equation is sufficient to understand how this um, technique works and is given by the following. The resolution of your um, observation is the ratio between the wavelength at which you perform the observation over the telescope size. Of course, this is not true in uh, just for VLBI, it's true for any a light collecting uh, experiment. Um, so in the case of, of um, wanting to take a picture of a black hole, of course you want the highest or the smallest resolution if you want possible because black holes are by definition the smallest objects you can produce. Um, so, and furthermore, they are so far away that they really are extremely small on the sky. 
at the same time, um, you want to you know, capture the light that is produced near the black hole and that reaches us. And unfortunately, all the high frequency wavelengths, uh, all of what high frequency uh, emission, all the, the, the short wavelengths are essentially absorbed. So forget about X, gamma, uh, even ultraviolet. What you're left with is that is essentially coming towards us is radio. And not only you know, just radio, you need really some very special wavelength, 1.3 millimeter or smaller, because that's the light that not only is um, not filtered, but also uh, doesn't suffer further scattering when uh, propagating from the source over to us. So in this equation, we have fixed the numerator is 1.3 millimeter to 130 gigahertz. For the bottom, you would like to have a, a large radio telescope and te radio telescope can be built to be large, okay? Um, the, the, the largest one is 500 meter in diameter is the far the Chinese telescope, radio telescope. But even if you put 500 meter in the denominator uh, that expression, you will get a resolution which is ridiculous. So what you want is actually create a virtual radio telescope, which is as large as the planet. And, and so the idea is that you can use small telescope, radio telescope of over 20, 30 meter in diameter, but uh, plays in, in very crucial positions in the world. And and, and, and connect these through um, this technique, which is LVBI. Essentially, you are making sure that you collect uh, the same wavefront, um, both in Arizona and at Hawaii, and uh, in California or in Chile and so on. Of course, you know, um, in order, if you do this, then, then essentially the, your, your, your radio dish is as big as the separation between these two telescopes. And the catch here is that um, in order for you to do this in practice, you have to make sure that you are recording not just the electric field reaching the receiver of the radio telescope, but also the timestamp, because that's the only way in which you can uh, ensure that you're really collecting, uh, you're really collecting the data from the same wavefront. But if you do this and use this technique, so if you then take the data from uh, different radio telescope, you can produce an image. Um, of, of um, in the radio. And the reason why we have so many telescopes is, well, the earth rotates. And this means that each of these telescopes will be seeing the, um, the image only for a short amount of time, a few hours. But it will like to have an integration time which is as large as possible, because in this way, your information on the image, which is collected in a Fourier space of the image, is as uh, high as possible. And that is why we have you know, um, telescope going from Hawaii over to, uh, to France. And they are continuously taking data over a time interval of about 10, 12 hours. Of course, if we had telescopes say in India or uh, further east, um, this would be very, very useful. So I, I will stop here with my description of the experiment. I think you already have uh, a basic idea how this was done. But again, I invite you to look at Shep's talk uh, on Friday. Now, that's exactly what we've done in 2017. In April 2017, we, we, um, we I say the Event Horizon Telescope, has sent teams to the various telescopes. You see there is one in Mexico, in Chile, at the South Pole, Hawaii, and Arizona, and Spain. And, and all of these people is, uh, uh, at, the, at the same time were collecting data. And if you look at them, you see that there is in, something in common in all of these photos. And in particular, all the people are smiling. Now, if you ask yourself, why is it that people are smiling? It's because it was sunny. Yeah, so this is the paradox uh, about all this trick that you are collecting um, data, well, light coming from 55 million light years away from you. So it, is, it has taken 55 million years to travel up to you. And then it's sufficient that there is some clouds two kilometers above the telescope and it, it, that light will be absorbed. So everybody is happy here because you know it's perfect weather. We never had so much luck uh, in other times where we try to, to take the data in 2018, in 2019, we never had, uh, you know, good weather across all of the, all of the various telescopes. Of course, you know, if 
there is one telescope which has bad weather, that telescope will not contribute. And so the amount of information you will receive is bad. And you know, this is on 11th, we, we released the image on the, um, on the 10th of April, 2019. And on the 11th, you can see that essentially it gone around the world. It has been calculated that in a matter of two days, 4.5 billion um, people have seen the image. That's you know, a very large uh, fraction of the human population. And, uh, and I think part of this is because um, you know, the image was just the source um, for the social media to come up with a number of interesting interpretations as you, you can see uh, in this um, snapshot. Okay, so what is it we've seen is this. Um, these are four images uh, coming from the four days where the data is sufficiently good. And they tell us something very important. First of all, they tell us that the image are different. They are not like, identical. And at the same time, they are all very similar. You will see there are some features which move from one day to the other. But this is exactly what we were expecting um, because we know that the time scales for the variability of M87, which we knew at a mass of, of a few billion solar masses, could not be of the order of a day. So um, we were essentially taking a photo of a mountain and you don't expect the mountain to change during the time you take the photo. At the same time, you also expect that uh, the mountain doesn't look the same every day, but uh, different days will give you different perceptions of the mountain because of the variability in weather, in cloud coverage and whatever, okay? So these images as, um, as we see them now are the result of this, uh, of a very long and actually complex process of um, conversion of the data, you know, of electric field into something that looks like this. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave Shep, to explain how you do this. Now, when we did these images, the next point was given to us theorists to explain what is this and what can we learn from this uh, donut um, type of, of, of object. And this is where our work started. In particular, in Europe, we could count on a, a very substantial funding from the European Research Council, which is um, called Black Hole CAM, which is a synergy grant given to my colleagues, Michael Kramer and Heino Falken, Megan and Bond. And essentially, if you want to think about how you produce a theoretical interpretation of that image, you have, you, you have to split the problem into three parts. The first one amounts to calculating general relativistic magneto hydrodynamic or GRMHD simulations in arbitrary space times. Next, you have to ray trace um, the emission coming from these space times and do a radiative transfer calculation. And, and later on, deconvolve the images to take into account the uh, finite size uh, of the beam of the various telescope. And the last point, which is not a trivial one, is once you produce a lot of theoretical data, you have to compare with the observations. And as I've shown you, we have just four images to compare with. And um, within this black hole cam, we have essentially developed three codes, BARC, BOSS, and GINA, that do exactly these three steps, one, two, and three. So BARC is a GRMHD um, code. Uh, BOSS does the ray tracing and the radio transfer, and, um, and GINA does the comparison with the observation. It's a genetic algorithm um, approach. The real heroes of all of this are these people who, who were part of, of my group, essentially, um, all of them um, have left me now because they all moved to faculty position elsewhere. But uh, you know, it, it's important to, to uh, underline that you know, it's their work. Now, I am a theorist, so I think about my work in terms of equations before I think in terms of physical results because these are the equations I need to solve. And I'm particularly lucky that I, I don't need to solve the field equations. Um, so the Einstein's equation, that's something I normally do when I wear my other hat, which is the hat of, you know, binary black hole or binary neutron star modeler. But here I don't have to worry about this because I can consider that the space time is fixed. Uh, the plasma is just accreting on the mass of this black hole. And so what I need to solve are 
conservation of energy and momentum, conservation of rest mass, and an equation of state, which actually is pretty simple. And because I'm doing uh, MHD, I need Maxwell equations. So then my energy momentum tensor on the right hand side would be the composition of the fluid plus the electromagnetic field. Okay. And I have to do this in 2D, 3D. Um, I will not bother you with, with uh, technical aspects. And in addition, I need to solve the general relativistic relative transfer equation. So I need to define an intensity, um, a distribution of the uh, photon, uh, um, uh, photon distribution function in terms of their energy, calculating an invariant and, and see how this invariant changes along uh, geodesic paths that I will calculate. Um, okay, so this is um, essentially just to give you an idea of the um, of the basic mathematical framework. And now let's go back to physics. And um, I want to show you a typical um, 3D simulation of an accretion to a black hole so that you can appreciate what are the basic of the physics going on. So I'm, I'm choosing a curved black hole with spin 0.93. Don't ask me why. Um, I'm using a set of coordinates which allow me to have um, to go inside the horizon. And I, I, produce, I, I create a torus. Um, which I then uh, endow with certain magnetic fields so that an instability develops and this drives accretion. So this is the MRI. As you can see in red, yellow, this is the rest mass density, while in blue, white, I'm showing the magnetization. This is the ratio between the, um, the magnetic energy over the rest mass energy. So there where you see blue and white, essentially you're seeing a lot of strong magnetic field and essentially very little matter. And vice versa, if you see red and, and yellow, you see a lot of matter and no, no magnetic field or a weaker magnetic field. And what you can see is that accretion is not a steady process. It, this is because there is an instability, there is a turbulent motion. And so it's a bit like being next to a waterfall. You will see a, an overall steady inflow of matter, but at any time it will not be the same. Now, this is, uh, I've moved the camera so that this is the orientation at which we think we are looking at M87. And now I will switch on and, and, and calculate what is the emission in the radio. So this is photons at 230 gigahertz reaching us. As you can see, um, there is an overall circular shape uh, and there is a bottom part which is brighter. Now, this looks so simple just because we're looking at, a, at it in a very special configuration. But if you look at the photon field around a black hole, this is far more complicated than it looks and uh, this is when you use this synthetic data and you convolve them with the finite size beam of the radio telescope. You see, this is what you would expect to see, something that flickers on time scales of several days. And if you compare, you know, this is not very different from what we actually have observed. And um, I will now want to show you, um, um, just to, to give you an idea about the size of, of our calculations, you know, the jet is much larger than what I've shown you so far. Now, that's the first step, doing, you know, knowing, learning what happens to plasma when it falls onto a black hole. The next step is understanding where the light comes from. So tracing photons near a black hole, and this is not, you know, a trivial task because it's very different from what happens, uh, say, here on Earth. So take a black hole and suppose that there is a thin disk, which is optically uh, thick, and it is emitting light. And you want to see and, and, and image this onto a photographic plate at a given angle i. Then, of course, you will get all the photons that are, are shot from the, the, from the disk directly towards you. Okay, So you will see the first part of the disk. But because space-time is curved, you will also see photons that were supposed to go straight, but actually are bent and come towards you. So you will actually see the part behind the black hole, the, sh the sheet of the disk, which is behind the black hole. And to make things even more complicated, you will actually see also the sheet of the black hole, or sorry, of the disk, which is under. So this is an image you probably have seen before. This is coming from interstellar, which is a quite sophisticated, almost correct, not entirely correct imaging of, of a supermassive black hole. And what you can see, therefore, is the part of the disk which is right in front of you, the part which is behind the black hole, and the part of the disk which is below. And this 
teaches us an important lesson um, that if we, if we need to hide, we shouldn't go behind a black hole because that would not help us. Um, next, you know, th 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 there is um, something that, that I mentioned about, you know, um, the, the presence of, of a dark region, okay? And this is called the shadow. And often people um, tend to, to, to confuse the shadow with the event horizon. The event horizon is, you know, we can't see the event horizon while we can see, of course, the shadow. And to make the distinction clearer, let me just explain it like so. Suppose you have a source of light and you have a black hole. Well, no, there are going to be photons emitted by the source of light, which will go straight into the black hole. <coughs> and so if you are an observer over here, you're not gonna see that light. At the same time, there are going to be photons which do not hit the horizon, but they get close enough to the horizon, actually within a particular orbit, which is called a photon orbit or the capture um, uh, radius of photons. And these, these, these photons will you know, eventually be captured. And so what we see here as observers is a region which is essentially deprived of light because there is something in between the source of light and us, and that's a black hole. And it's not just the event horizon. To give an idea of the size, the event horizon for Schwarzschild is 2m. The circular photon orbit is at 3m. Okay, anything, we, uh, you know, this is the impact parameter if you want. Um, and, and, and sorry, the impact parameter at the circular orbit, this is the, the radius of the shadow, and this is square root of, of, of 27, so roughly five. So the shadow is a region with a deficit of light. It's important that the shadow cannot be dark or should not be dark, because if you take a photon here, say, or even a photon very close to the black hole, and you shoot it towards the observer, this photon will have no problem uh, reaching uh, the observer, okay? There is nothing preventing it reaching us. So the shadow is overall a region darker than the rest. Um, the, the shape of the shadow is actually very informative. And um, if, if you have spherical symmetry, then no matter how you look at it, the shadow will always be a circle. However, if you are, um, if the black hole is rotating, then you will see that the shadow actually is deformed by the, the, the frame dragging essentially. There's going to be a part which is shaved off. The, the centroid will be moved to the right and this is what it will look like. So um, of course, if we instead were to look at this from the pole, this would still be a perfect circle, okay? So there is an interesting piece of information here that can allows us in principle to tell what is a spin by just looking at the, at the geometrical properties of the shadow. Now, the size of the shadow, so this is the shadow over here, the size of the shadow depends on the inclination angle. And, and this is explained in this other animation over here. As you can see, if I'm, we're looking at face on, it's a perfect uh, annulus. However, if we see edge on or towards edge on, then we're gonna see something which is uh, not, not symmetric. And in particular, we're gonna see two different parts of the shadow, you know, this part over here and the one below. And if you think you understand now a little bit how light moves around a black hole, um, you are ready to take in the next message. And that is that all I've shown you is actually not what we see because MHD simulations, as I explained, are actually giving us a, a knowledge of a, an accretion disk which is not thin, um, but is actually thick and optically thin. So what we expect is more something like this. And I'm just rotating it so you can see again the how the inclination of the observer completely changes the way uh, the same object is perceived. If you see it right now, when it is perfectly face on, you see a perfectly symmetric emission. There is nothing which is boosted towards us. But at any other inclination, say so, it's going to be a region where light is coming towards us. So it's boosted. And because of this, it's going to uh, appear brighter. This is just a simple Doppler boost, uh, a relativistic Doppler boost, uh, which amplifies the intensity of light received. So um, that's the basic. Um, now we need to um, take the observations and try to make um, some sense of it. And, and what we did is to explore this principle of accretion to a black hole 
in the most general possible way we could. And, and so we had to select a space of parameters and essentially we have a black hole spin, um, which you know, we take to be between minus one, one and one. The way uh, plasma accretes essentially is bimodal. Um, it can, you know, it, it effectively it's, it's, you know, um, it is a bit more complicated than that, but for the time being, let me just say that it's bimodal. You can have either a type of, of um, accretion where the magnetic field doesn't play a, a, a very active role. It's just dragged along. Oh, well, of course it is, you know, produced and, and, and amplified and so on, but it, it doesn't feed back so strongly. And it's called a sane type of accretion or standard accretion. Um, or a MAD, which is a magnetically um, arrested disk. And this is a situation which is the opposite. It is the case when the magnetic field can become so strong because um, you, you, you put it in at initially uh, to be so strong that um, magnetic pressure can build up and even choke accretion. You have to imagine that um, in, in such a situation, um, the magnetic pressure near the, the horizon can reach values such that the plasma cannot go further in. Then there is um, the issue of how you produce light. Um, and and um, so, uh, of course, you know, the black hole mass will determine the size of the horizon and therefore the size of the shadow, as I've explained. But also the microphysics of the mission is very important. We believe almost certainly from the, what we know in, in terms of plasma physics um, from, from the sun and, and in other astrophysical um, environments that the emission we are seeing at these wavelengths is synchrotron emission. And, but beyond that, we have very little understanding of what is going on. We don't know exactly where the light is coming from the jet, from the disk. And don't forget, this is an optically thin plasma. This means that it doesn't matter what is the, where the emission is coming, because even the part of the jet which is receding from you might actually provide you with some um, um, light. And I, I can discuss this more in detail if uh, questions arise or, or, or so. And, and then we also have some additional information from previous observations, okay? We know what is the black hole mass, we know what is the inclination, um, we know what is the X-ray luminosity in the jet and what is the jet power. This piece of information we don't use, okay? Well, at least we don't use in our analysis because we want to have priors which are essentially zero. We want to simply be able to say on the basis of our observation alone, this is what we can tell. So let me spend a few words on the electron thermodynamics. Um, because this is possibly the most delicate part of, of, of the whole construction. As I said, we believe it is synchrotron, but our simulations, the MHD simulations, tell us about the inertial part of the plasma, and the inertial part is the ions. Those are the, the heavy particles. So essentially, when I showed you the, uh, the disk, I'm, I'm showing you the, uh, the accretion of the ions, but there are electrons, and these electrons uh, can either be fully coupled or weakly coupled, and we don't know what is the temperature because the only temperature that we track is the temperature of the uh, ions. So we have the problem of having to define the energy distribution of the electrons. And um, we've made a, a few assumptions. And um, the first one is that we assume that there is a thermal temperature distribution, okay? This is probably reasonable, it's not certainly correct, but it is probably reasonable. Uh, we, I can tell you that it is reasonable because we've seen what are the effects of non-thermal distributions and uh, these are not great. And so um, then we need a recipe to relate the temperature of the ion, Ti, to the temperature of the electrons, Te. And ideally you would need a plasma model, a microphysical plasma model um, to do this, uh, in particular, you would need a two temperature fluid description. What we did is something more simple. We just have a, a recipe that allows us to relate the two Ti and Te to some very phenomenological expression of this type. Um, what is this? Well, we have a plasma parameter, essentially the gas, uh, the, the ratio between the gas pressure and the magnetic pressure. And then we have a coefficient here, which is just, we call R high. It's just a number. And essentially by playing with this number, we are able to switch between an emission that comes mostly from the disk or mostly from the jet. 
And these are the values of the R high that we consider. So essentially, you know, this is the set of um, the space of parameters we have considered. And so what we've, did, we've done is we have performed some uh, 3D high resolution simulations, about 50 of them. Half of them were done here in Frankfurt. Then for each of these simulations, we built a scenario, which is essentially a variant of that simulation where we paint the electrons through that recipe and change the value of the coefficient. And in this way, we build something like 400 scenarios. And just to give you an idea of what that means in practice, you know, this is just a simple um, um, like extract of the, um, of the, of the um, um, database of simulations and scenario that we have produced. So you're gonna see that are going to be very small uh, uh, shadows, um, very large shadows, um, a lot of emission from the disk, very uh, small emission from near the shadow. And everything varies because as I was mentioning, um, this is a turbulent accretion process. So um, this should give you a, an idea. These are averaged over a long time scale, just um, taking all of the simulations that were showing, well, not all, some of them. So here I'm showing our high, and here I'm showing the spin. So this is non-rotating, this is counter-rotating, this is uh, co-rotating, um, just so that you can appreciate, um, am I still, I, I see there is uh, some, some comment in the chat. Am I still going all right? Yeah. Uh, Luciano, okay. you're doing fine. I just wanted okay. to point out that, uh, you know, about five minutes, if you can finish, then we'll have some time for questions. Five minutes. Yes, um, okay, so let me, at the end of the day, we have built 60,000 images. And we have just four images, which are uh, the experimental ones, okay? So how do you do? Um, well, you have to come up with a, a, an MCMC or some other um, uh, approach where, um, um, where to find a match. And the way you do this is essentially each image can be seen as a set of data points in, in the Fourier space of the image. And this is uh, calculated in terms of what is called the closure phase and the visibility amplitude. Chap Dolman will probably give you um, a more detailed introduction to this. But essentially for every image that we produce synthetically, you can, um, you, 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 you will produce some of these points, which are the green ones. And, and then you have to compare through some chi squared with the actual observations. And then you produce in this way, a distribution of images that matches to a given value um, your, your observations. It's a bit like finding a, you know, a, an image out of 60,000 images. What you have is an image of a person uh, that is very uh, blurred and you try to find the best match among these, all the people that you have say in a studio. And what you do is you, you learn that um, you may not find the right image, but you find the type of person that matches your image. In particular, you find out that this person has to be someone with long hair, possibly a woman. So you classify your target by saying, what are the generic properties? Because these are robust. All of the images that you build have these properties. And this is an example of how good the match can be. So on the left, you have the observations. On the right, we have a theoretical model. We understand everything on a theoretical model. What is the emission properties? What is this black hole spin and mass? everything because it's theoretical. We build it out of a simulation. So you would say, wow, you, 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 you have got the answer. We have got the answer. The problem is that we got the answer way too often. And this is just to give you an idea of what I mean. These are four images, synthetic images, which have the same chi-squared match to the observations. And they are very similar, of course, they have to because they have the same chi-square, but they refer to completely different black holes, okay? This one is a Kirk rotating uh, at 0.94. This is a counter-rotating black hole. This is a Schwarzschild black hole. By playing with it, all the degrees of freedom that we have, and I was mentioning, you essentially are able to produce images which are very similar. Of course, this is um, good and bad at the same time. It's good because, um, again, tells you that 
the robustness to the conclusion is, 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 is enormous. We know that has to be a black hole because black holes, no matter what is the spin or the emission properties, produce something like that. The bad thing is that at the, mo at the moment, we cannot tell what is the, the spin of the black hole. And in fact, we have not given any, any uh, measurement of the spin of M87 star. Okay, um, so I will just quickly um, tell you that this can be improved if you put in some more information. Um, for instance, what is the jet power? What is the, um, um, the X-ray power in the jet and so on? And in this way, you can remove some of the degeneracies. But, you know, it's important to underline that on the basis of the image alone, this is not possible. Okay, I, I have about two, two minutes to, and I will just concentrate on the, on the bottom line here. And it is, um, you know, can we really be sure this is a, a curved black hole and not something else? And what we've done is we consider uh, the simplest um, but um, reasonable exotic black hole, which is a dilaton black hole. Essentially, it's, it's still a black hole in GR, where you add some additional fields, the action and the dilaton field. As a matter of fact, we even consider just the dilaton field. And we then compared, um, you know, exactly the same procedure that I've shown you before, also for a dilaton black hole. And I will not go through the simulations. Um, well, let me just show you the, uh, the end result. So the end result is that this is Kerr and this is a dilaton black hole. And I'm, I'm considering this for, for the masses and scattering of Sagittarius A star. And, uh, as you can see, they're very similar. They're not identical, they are very similar. But then if you put in the fact that uh, we expect any image to be actually quite scattered with S, uh, Sagittarius A star, then this is the, the, uh, the difference. Once again, they are different, but you cannot conclude uh, with robustness, which one of which, uh, whether it is a curved black hole or a dilaton black hole. So overall at present, it's not possible to distinguish between these two black holes. And this is why the title of my talk is not the first image of a curved black hole, but it is the first image of a black hole because that's what we think is robust. We can do this, we've done this also for other objects like a boson star, but I don't have the time. So here are my conclusions. Um, um, Black Hole Cam, this European project has covered all of the aspects, especially the theoretical ones. We, with the EHT, we looked into accretion to curved black holes extensively. We have looked at things which have not been looked over the last 30 years, but we were forced to do so in order to interpret the images. Um, we are exploring alternatives to curved black holes. So far, boson stars can be distinguished while other black holes cannot. And you know, I think EHT has had the very important merit of showing that supermassive black holes are hosted at the center of galaxies. This is something maybe you've learned the first time you've taken an astronomy lecture, but now we know it is, is true. That was just an assumption. Most importantly for me as a theorist, I think EHT has transformed the event horizon from a mathematical object to a testable uh, property. And this is the very first step of any scientific approach and therefore very valuable. Okay, I'll stop here so that I can get some questions. I think I was uh, thank 30. Thank you very much, Luciano, yeah. for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, I guess it points to many decades forward of uh, forward to much more detailed uh, in our results. Uh, okay, so Vivek Tatar has a yeah. Uh, thank you for a very nice uh, talk. I'd like to ask you, is there any other observable, uh, such as maybe polarization or something else, uh, that could help in, uh, you know, uh, deciphering whether it's a curved black hole or a boson star or whatever? Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. Uh, there is, um, the images, when we were taking the images, we were also measuring the polarization of the, of the, of the data. And we just submitted a paper to RPJ where we collect our results. I will not spoil this paper, but um, hopefully it's going to be soon out. We have polarized images of M87 star and there is an interesting um, um, you know, conclusion that can be drawn from this. Bear in mind that the amount of polarization is not very large, okay? We're talking about few tens of a percent or even less. So um, yes, 
polarization is possible and will will teach us about um, more than about a spin, will teach us about the, the physical condition, which as I stress is actually important because if you know what is the emission mechanism, then you, you can remove some of the degeneracies. And now we have a better understanding of what are the properties of the, of, 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 of the magnetic field. And so some of the models we were conceiving actually are, have been excluded. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Arpan? Uh, Hi. So, uh, at some point uh, in your uh, slides, you introduce a parameter R high uh, H A G H. So, uh, this is, I think, this is a dimensionless parameter. But why its value is of the order of hundred? No, no, no. So, I mean, um, I, 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 you should still be able to see my screen. R high is really a number. It's a knob we we, we dial to go from one to one hundred and sixty. Okay. So um, depending on which is um, um, whether you're using R1 or R160, you are putting more emission into the jet or into the, onto the disc. I think the jet is one and the disc is 160. Now, why 160 is because if you go beyond 160, you don't see much of a difference. And so we just uh, didn't do those, those scenarios. So there is no uh, microscopic principle to fix this. It's just a free parameter in your theory. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid there isn't. You know, if we if we could come up with a with a, um, a microphysical prescription about what is a reasonable range for our high, we would have used it. Um, you know, it really we really don't know where the light comes from. That's the bottom line, and uh, and the light can be coming either from near the jet, uh, very close to the event horizon, farther away from the event horizon, and in order to have um, the the largest possible span of the phase of the space of parameters we had to parameterize this this knowledge and as you can see this has brought us the negative aspects of degeneracies we don't know you know um, whether it's a Schwarzschild or a curve because exactly because of you know this value r high can mimic either a rotation or a, a different electron pr uh, prescription distribution okay and thanks uh I don't see any other hand, so maybe I should ask you a question. You, I thought you mentioned that you chose A to be 0.9375 or some specific value, and you said, I'll come back to why I showed you a simulation for that, or, or was that something that I... No, so if, if, if any of you is, is interested in, in why it's such a bizarre number, is because you know we had to, uh, to cut the space of parameters into 16th, and um, 15 over 16 is 0 0.9375, that's all. Uh, and uh, so at this point, is it fair to say that the theoretical modeling of these um, images from VLBI, uh, you know, is good enough for the level of observations we have or the, you know, uh, what do you should fit in, you know, the res resolution that or, you know, uh, that we have? I mean, what I'm saying is theoretical modeling seems to be good enough for the data we have. And uh, going forward, is there a scenario where the data would be requiring you to push your uh, modeling to much finer levels? So the way forward is on two different and orthogonal directions. One is um, increasing the resolution, essentially. And this can happen either by changing the frequency which you observe so going to higher frequency, which technically is more difficult and technologically is challenging, or increasing the size of, 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 your, of your telescope. And of course, you know, you can't increase the size of the Earth, but you can always increase the arm length by using the Earth and a satellite or a number of satellites. So going into space is where VLBI will um, provide us with additional resolution, maybe uh, one order of magnitude, which will allow us to distinguish some of the features that right now we cannot distinguish. In particular, we may be able to see much better the, the, the edge of the shadow and therefore draw some conclusions on the spin of the black hole. But when it comes down to the, you know, what is it that we can do theoretically, I think you know, right now we are, we are improving our emission models. This is where I think um, we are you know, not, not most advanced. Um, and so we are considering non-thermal emission models, a number of them. 
And, and the other direction is, you know, considering alternative to curve black holes and uh, finding if there are signatures, we can maybe not now with the present resolution, but uh, in 10 years time, 20 years time, when the resolution will be sufficiently high to be able to tell whether we really have black holes in, 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 in GR um, and in vacuum or we have something else. Thanks. Uh, oh, I see a question by Ajit. Uh, sorry, I, is there a time to ask a question? Very quick question. Yeah, quick one. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, quick. Uh, one would like to have a independent uh, observation measurement of the mass. Is there some isolated object, isolated cloud orbiting far away from this plasma? So, so then your plasma dependence becomes independent, and something like what was done for uh, Milky Way black hole. Of course, here it's a star, but you'll have to have some gas cloud emitting here or something. Is that, uh, right, so, so that, that would be very nice. In fact, um, you know, if we, if we had the perfect object would be a pulsar. If we can see right. a pulsar, then we have a perfect, um, you know, space-time probe because I, we can measure the, 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 the spin of the black hole to 1% and um, the, the, the mass of the, uh, the black hole to even smaller error. The problem is that this technique just, you know, as stars, or a pulsar cannot be used outside of our galaxy. We simply don't see these objects in M87. It's way too far from us. So this is something that can be pursued and is going to be pursued in the future, but for uh, Sagittarius A star. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Luciano, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, let me uh, uh, Stop you know, move to the next speaker. Thanks again, uh, Luciano. And, uh, uh, the next speaker is uh, James Latimer. Uh, he is going to talk about equation of state. Uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'll share my screen. Right. Okay, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me um, to present this talk. Um, it's uh, very nice to virtually get out of the house, even if I can't be there in person, which I would really love to do. Um, I wanted to talk about measurements of neutron stars and the dense matter equation of state, uh, summarizing some recent work, which is, um, I think, very groundbreaking and uh, very uh, insightful as to the properties of dense matter. I first would like to acknowledge the generous funding I've received from the Department of Energy in the US, from NASA, and from NSF, and also acknowledge uh, recent collaborators, uh, most importantly, the last one, uh, Tianqi Zhao, who is uh, my student, finishing student at uh, Stony Brook University. So the main topics I want to address briefly are neutron stars and how they depend on the equation of state. Um, I wanna talk about constraints that arise from measurements of pulsar masses concerning the maximum mass and also the influence that causality has. It turns out that very simple concepts like causality uh, play a very important role in our understanding of neutron stars. Uh, we have new theoretical tools available uh, to measure the properties, to estimate the properties of neutron matter in a density regime that's important for neutron stars. There are also condensed matter experiments that surprisingly can set some constraints on the properties of neutron stars as well. This is the unitary gas. Um, I will then focus on how we measure astrophysically uh, properties of neutron stars coming from radio, X-ray, and gravitational wave observations. And I'll focus on the recent binary merger, GW170817, and also recent measurements of the pulsar J0030 from the neutron star interior composition um, explorer. So Danny Paj at the um, National University in Mexico City 
uh, long ago prepared for us this very nice uh, picture of a neutron star um, illustrating uh, its major uh, uh, structural properties and uh, highlighting some very interesting internal physics. Um, I don't know if my uh, cursor is, is visible, um, but the deep interior has a question mark. Um, this is the region of matter above a few times the nuclear saturation density where we still don't know if a phase transition to quark, deconfined quark matter uh, is present, whether there are large populations of hyperons or K and condensates and so on. What we do understand a bit more are the other four uh, major parts of a neutron star. The inner core, uh, this purple region, um, which uh, extends down to the nuclear saturation density at which um, we have a transition to the crust of the star. In the, in, the, in, the, in the outer core, this purple region matter consists primarily of a neutron, proton, electron, muon, uniform liquid, and uh, it's very neutron rich. And so its properties can be estimated uh, quite well if we understand pure neutron matter at densities uh, in the range of one half to double the uh, saturation density inside of nuclei, which is about three times 10 to the 14th grams per cubic centimeter or 0.16 baryons per cubic fermi. The transition between the outer core and the crust can be quite complicated with interesting transport um, uh, properties um, uh, and, and viscosity properties that might. Uh, will play a role in uh, details of gravitational wave uh, signals and other aspects. And um, in the uniform liquid, we have uniform neutron proton matter. And in the uh, bulk of the crust, we have isolated nuclei. And the transition between the crust and the core uh, consists of a deformation of nuclei as they become relatively more concentrated, closer together. Uh, changes in the geometry that can change them from spheres to rods and even plates, and then a, 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 a small phase transition uh, that uh, can uh, then go between uh, these uh, complicated shapes and, and uniform matter. The envelope of the star is a relatively thin region, this green region, in which um, it acts as a heat blanket on the star. So the the bulk of the energy we see emerging from the neutron star after, um, after uh, millions of years is in the form of X-ray radiation. Uh, before that time, neutron stars cool primarily from neutrinos emerging from the, from the core. But the envelope acts as a heat blanket and so can affect the temperatures of the X-rays that we observe. And finally, the atmosphere is a thin layer of only a few centimeters uh, thickness that uh, affects the spectrum. And so the, the composition of the atmosphere and the envelope are very important for understanding X-rays coming from the star. Unfortunately, we don't have any independent confirmations of the, um, of the exact compositions of, 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 of either. Now in both the outer core and in the uh, inner core of the star, uh, it's believed that neutrons are superfluid. And in the inner core, in addition, the protons are superconducting. So this is very interesting. Uh, effects on the thermal evolution of neutron stars also could affect the glitch properties of pulsars and, and so on. But in this talk, I won't have time to uh, investigate those, those properties. We're going to be focusing mostly on the global mass and radii of neutron stars and uh, the relation to the underlying equation of state. So the relation between the equation of state and the masses and radii of neutron stars is actually very straightforward. It's controlled by two equations in general relativity known as the tolman oppenheimer volkov equations that relate the uh, pressure, P, and the energy density, epsilon, of the equation of state uh, to the uh, uh, radius inside, uh, at some point inside the star. We assume spherical symmetry and the mass interior to that point, little m. If we begin with a point, for example, say this point here that has a certain pressure, scale over here is, 
in units of MeV per cubic fermi, so a few hundred MeV per cubic fermi, for example, at a density of about six times the nuclear saturation density, or about one and a half, 1.2 to 1.5 times 10 to the 15th grams per cubic centimeter. If we begin with this point at the center and integrate to the surface where the pressure is zero, we find a configuration that has about 1.8 solar masses for this particular equation of state and a radius of maybe 11, 11 kilometers. If we begin with a central density and pressure that's smaller, we'll end up with a smaller mass and perhaps a slightly larger radius. At any point, when we look at the, com at, at, the, at the sum of all the points that we can achieve by changing the central density and pressure, we produce what's known as the mass radius curve. So at very small central pressures, we have very small masses around a few tenths of a solar mass and radii extending up to hundreds of kilometers. As we increase the mass to a solar mass, the radius stabilizes into a very small range. Uh, most observed neutron stars are between, all observed neutron stars are between 1.1 and about 2.1 solar masses. So the radii of those neutron stars isn't going to be very different uh, from, from, from each other, um, typically around uh, 10 to 15 kilometers. If we push the central pressure or energy density to large enough values, we can break the neutron star, it reaches a maximum mass above which uh, if you increase the central pressure above that point, it will be dynamically unstable and will collapse into a black hole in a matter of microseconds. So the two important aspects of neutron star structure that this figure illustrates is the existence of this maximum mass, which is believed to be at least two solar masses because we observe neutron stars with that mass. The uh, maximum mass could extend up into the vicinity near three solar masses. So this is an uncertain quantity at present. And secondly, um, neutron stars should have a small range of radii from in the observed mass interval between say one and two solar masses. But we don't know exactly where the center of that interval is. That's illustrated in the next, in this figure, which shows a variety of uh, commonly used equations of state theoretically generated. These are the mass radius curves that result from those equations of state. Some of them, like GS1 and MS1, can now be ruled out on the basis of the fact that they don't produce the two solar masses maximum mass that is the minimum of two that's, that's observed. But for the ones that do survive, they all generally have the property that no matter what the mass of the neutron star is between one and two solar masses, the radius is in a very small range. However, as we go from one equation of state to another, the radius uh, is observed to vary over quite a large range. So if we can measure the radius of a single neutron star with a known mass, this is extremely important because it would, it would eliminate a wide variety of equations of state. The second thing I'd like to point out from this figure is that there is a region of mass radius space that is not theoretically achievable once you impose uh, general relativity and causality. And this green region shows, for example, uh, it's dependent on what the observed minimum neutron star maximum mass is. And for 1.97 solar masses, this green region illustrates the masses and radii that cannot be observed. Or that will not be observed because uh, you would have to have an equation of state that violates the, uh, the causality condition that the speed of sound has to be less than the speed of light. And so, of course, these known equa these theoretical equations of state uh, observe causality, and so they won't penetrate um, into this region. But it's already interesting that with the existence of a two solar mass maximum mass, this causality constraint tells us that the minimum radius for a 1.4 solar mass star is in the vicinity of about eight kilometers. So we will never observe a 1.4 solar mass star of less than eight kilometers, no matter what the composition or internal structure of the neutron star is, no matter what the equation of state is, causality dictates this minimum radius. For maximum radii, we have radii in the order of say 15 kilometers, we do observe uh, the, 
a pulsar, the most rapidly rotating pulsar has a spin period of 716 hertz. And this, um, uh, this means that for this star not to be able to break apart uh, due to centrifugal effects, that for a given mass, the radius is constrained to be smaller uh, than a certain value. So this green region for this particular neutron star is excluded. And if we could observe neutron stars with larger spin periods, we would be able to exclude a larger range of, um, of, the, of the mass radius diagram. Roughly speaking, the, this curve is given by the relationship the mass is proportional to radius to the one third power. And so if the spin frequency is increased, then this curve will bend um, upwards, penetrating more into this gray region. So already we can see that typical neutron stars of 1.4, 1.5 solar masses um, uh, apparently have radii that are less than about um, 15 kilometers. But this still leaves a quite a wide range of possible uh, possible radii. And so the nuclear physics is what will control um, that aspect. Long ago, uh, Prakash and I discovered a phenomenological relationship that connects the radii of typical neutron stars, like 1.4 solar mass neutron stars, with the pressure near the nuclear saturation density. So for example, consider this central set of, of, of data points at the density of one and a half times the nuclear saturation density, um, different equations of state, which are connected with the one shown in the previous figure together with a few others uh, by these acronyms, predict radii of 1.4 solar mass stars that extend from about nine kilometers to as much as 16 kilometers. But if you, but measuring the pressure of each of those equations of state at three halves the saturation density, and taking it in this combination with the radius, with the predicted radius of a 1.4 solar mass star, we find that in fact there's a very small spread of these values. In other words, the pressure at one and a half times the saturation density is tightly correlated with the radii of 1.4 solar mass stars. So we have two ways of approaching this problem. We can measure the radius directly from observations, or we can measure the pressure from nuclear physics experiments. And either of those, if measured at around the saturation density, here's the correlation that exists at one times the saturation density. It's not quite as good. And uh, at twice, it's a little bit better. But if we could measure the pressure experimentally in the laboratory, we would already have a determination of neutron star radii accurate to uh, several uh, percent. Now, what determines the pressure of neutron star matter in the vicinity of the nuclear saturation density? And that turns out to be controlled uh, largely by a quantity known as the nuclear symmetry energy. This is because neutron star matter is very close to pure neutron matter where the proton fraction is zero and a long way from the matter that we measure inside of nuclei, which is symmetric matter, where the proton fraction is closer to a half. Symmetry energy is simply defined as the difference in energy at a given density between pure neutron matter and symmetric matter. This figure illustrates the energies of neutron matter, in the upper curves, nuclear matter, symmetric matter is uh, the lower set of curves, and at the given density, for example, the saturation density, we can see that the symmetry energy is roughly about 30 MeV. Nuclear matter is bound by about 16 MeV at the saturation density. Neutron matter at the same density will have an energy of around 15 or so uh, MeV per, per baryon. And the symmetry energy decreases as the density decreases and increases with increasing density. And if we expand the symmetry energy around the saturation density, we find a linear, uh, the, the lowest order linear term is controlled by a, a parameter known as L. And uh, L is around 50 MeV. The value at the saturation density itself, as I said, is about 31 MeV. So this is the second parameter of, of the symmetry that we consider. So these two parameters are roughly known to be about 31 MeV and around 50 MeV respectively. 
Now, it's widely believed from a theoretical perspective um, that um, the uh, symmetry energy can be the, the energy of matter at arbitrary proton fraction at a given density is um, basically given by the lowest order term in a uh, Taylor series expansion in the, uh, in the uh, neutron excess, 1 minus 2x. And uh, so the lowest order term is going to be quadratic. And um, if this, for, if this uh, expression actually uh, sat is satisfied at all proton fractions between 0 and a half, then pure neutron matter uh, can be uh, the energy and pressure of pure neutron matter complete then determine these two symmetry energy properties. So we can get a handle on these symmetry properties from studying neutron rich nuclei in the laboratory. And theoretically, we can also get some understanding of those same parameters by studying pure neutron matter. Now neutron star matter isn't exactly pure neutron matter. There's a small admixture of protons. The matter has to be in beta equilibrium, where the neutron and proton chemical potential difference equals the electron chemical potential. And at high densities, this dictates that neutrons are overwhelmingly populated. And it turns out that the proton fraction ends up being uh, a few percent at the saturation density. So the pressure at the saturation density is, in fact, extremely close to this limit of L times NS over 3. This correction is on the order of um, a few percent um, at the saturation density and increases with density uh, relatively slowly. So this is a very interesting result that uh, measuring properties of neutron matter, in particular these two symmetry energy properties, allow us to determine the pressure near the nuclear saturation density, and uh, therefore uh, the radii of neutron stars, completely independent of measurements um, from, uh, from uh, astrophysical observations. Now, there's a very interesting uh, relationship between neutron matter and a uh, perfect uh, theoretical concept known as the unitary gas. Unitary gas consists of a sea of fermions that are interact between uh, interact via pairwise uh, S-wave interactions that have the property that the scattering length is infinite and uh, also has zero range. And this, interestingly, a gas of such fermions can be duplicated in cold atom experiments in, in cold atom traps, and Theoretically and experimentally, we observe that the, uh, there's a universal behavior um, in su such that the energy of this, of this gas is com completely controlled by what's called the Birch parameter after George Birch. Uh, basically, that the energy of the unitary gas is a fixed fraction of the Fermi energy of, of, of theoretical Fermi energy of the fermion gas. And... Uh, put into units where the density is in units of the nuclear saturation density, 0.16 per cubic Fermi, we find this very interesting simple relationship that the energy is about 12.6 MeV times the ratio of these densities to the two-thirds power. And one can easily show if, the, if this energy is actually a minimum, in other words, if, if, if real matter, neutron matter or neutron star matter, has an energy greater at all densities from the unitary gas, um, then um, you can set constraints on L and SV such that a wide range of those L and SV parameters can be excluded. So together with Tuz et al, we explored this and found that there's the boundary in SV L space is here with this green region being allowed. Uh, these different regions are different neutron matter, pure neutron matter calculations, which are seen to all um, obey this conjecture that neutron matter energy is always larger than that of the unitary gas. Now we think theoretically that neutron matter differs from a unitary gas primarily in the fact that the, inf that the scattering range is not infinite and not exactly zero range. Both of these differences make the neutron matter have an energy greater than the unitary gas. In addition, 
we know that three body interactions will also increase the repulsion of neutron matter. And so altogether, there are very good reasons for believing that this conjecture is, is in fact um, the case. And this sets a minimum to the radii of 1.4 neutron solar mass neutron stars of about 10 kilometers. So it's a two kilometer increase from the causality limit if we impose this unitary gas uh, conjecture. Now recently, uh, there has been very interesting um, developments in um, theoretical neutron matter studies coming from chiral effective field theory. And it's been found that this theory actually allows a systematic expansion of nuclear forces at low energies uh, based on the symmetries of quantum chromodynamics. And interestingly, it provides the only known consistent framework for estimating energy uncertainties. So as you go to higher and higher orders, uh, this expansion, uh, chiral expansion should converge. So far, it's been explored to the uh, third order. And uh, this, these colored bands show the one and two sigma, 68 and 95% confidence intervals for the energy and pressure of pure neutron matter, uh, respectively. In comparison, we show the energy of the unitary gas. We see that the unitary gas conjecture is in fact obeyed in this case. And uh, for the pressure, we see that the pressure at high densities is always greater than that of the unitary gas, but not necessarily at, um, at lower densities. Uh, many years ago, Alex Brown uh, formulated a, a limit to the energy of pure neutron matter based on the properties of doubly magic nuclei of about 11 MeV, plus or minus 1 MeV. And so that data point, so to speak, is shown here. And we can see that the unit, that the chiral effective field theory in, um, does obey that, um, that constraint. Now, nuclei themselves can be used to get an estimate of uh, S, V, and L properties. The most significant um, of these experiments are simply the measuring of the masses of nuclei. In the liquid drop model, the uh, major contribution to the energy of nuclei comes from symmetry, um, both in terms of the volume of the nucleus and the surface of the nucleus. And because the surface depends on A to the two thirds and the volume on A, Therefore, there's a high correlation between these two quantities, and therefore a high correlation between the inferred values of L and SV. And that's basically shown by this um, uh, elliptical uncertainty region in gray, uh, suggesting that the SV should be between 30 and 31 MeV, and L possibly between 35 and 55 or so MeV to one sigma. And slightly somewhat larger extent if we go to two sigma. Neutron matter studies um, can be explored through chiral EFT. And if we take the combination of symmetric nuclear matter studies with chiral EFT and pure neutron matter studies, you find a correlation between L and SV that intersects with the mass uncertainty region in this extent, but this but unfortunately, chiral EFT studies cannot yet predict the known properties of symmetric nuclear matter observed in, in nuclei uh, with a great deal of precision. So uh, this should be taken with a little grain of salt. Um, you can, however, fix the, the symmetric matter properties of, nu uh, of, of matter from nuclear experiment and together with pure neutron matter studies you then get a prediction of L and SV that is this blue uh, region. So there's a considerable overlap, again, in this, in this um, region over here between SV of 30 and, say, 31 MeV. Now, another way to measure the properties of symmetry properties of nuclei is the fact that neut very neutron-rich nuclei, like lead 208, have the property that the neutron distribution extends out extends to a larger radius than the than the protons uh, to by a few tenths of a, of, a, of a Fermi so the difference is exaggerated in this figure and uh, there's this 
very high correlation, it's been discovered by nuclear modeling between the skin thickness of these neutron rich of lead 208 and the L parameter. It's a linear relationship. So different experiments have been have, have measured the neutron skin thickness of lead. There's still considerable uncertainty in these experiments, but they're in the data points are illustrated in five different cases here. Most recently, the PREX2 results give a minimum of to one sigma of 0.2 Fermi's, which suggests that L uh, from the latest neutron skin measurement of lead is greater than about 70 MeV at the one sigma level. But at the two sigma level, this curve extends almost to the bottom of the figure here. So we need better nuclear studies in order to use the measurements of neutron skin of lead uh, uh, to, uh, to try to uh, restrict this uh, that region uh, even further than we have so far. Interestingly, there's been an ab initio calculation of the properties of calcium 48, which is also neutron rich and has a considerable neutron skin. And uh, those, uh, uh, those, um, those ab initio calculations predict that L is in the vicinity of uh, 50 um, MeV. So the, the band here illustrates the one sigma uncertainty from those ab initio experiments, which again overlaps between the estimates between chiral EFT and nuclear masses. So we think that these that the symmetry properties of matter and the neutron matter properties of matter in the vicinity of the nuclear saturation density are now understood reasonably well um, from nuclear experiments. We'd like to have further confirmation from neutron skin experiments of lead, and that will be pursued more in the, in the future. So causality already tells us that the radii of 1.4 solar mass stars is greater than 8. The unitary gas conjecture increases this to about 10. And when we look at theoretical neutron matter studies, we find that the ranges of, of neutron star radii are between 10 and about 13 kilometers. So now we turn to astrophysics and uh, we want to uh, look at the neutron star masses and radii that can be determined astrophysically. Pulsar timing accurately measures neutron star masses with unprecedented measurements. Um, and um, most neutron stars observed so far between 1.2 and 1.5, the lowest mass observed so far is about 1.17 solar masses. The highest mass is important because the maximum mass of neutron stars has to be greater than this value. Most accurately measured one so far is 2.14. Um, with an uncertainty of about a tenth of an MeV and two MeV to two solar masses with an uncertainty of about 2%. There are higher measured masses um, observed, but they have rather large uncertainties. And so they don't contribute uh, greatly to the, the estimate that the neutron star maximum mass is at least two to 2.1 uh, solar masses. So thermal and bursting observations of x-rays also yield uh, radii, but um, these are uncertain to a few kilometers. They have considerable at present systematic uncertainties. These include quiescent sources and globular clusters, explosions on accreting neutron stars, and the pulse profiling modeling that I'll finish up by discussing the results from NICER experiment. Gravitational waves from merging neutron stars are able to measure masses, of the components and also their radii through measurements of tidal deformabilities. So GW170817, the first observed binary neutron star merger, was extremely uh, serendipitous observation. It told us that these, this so-called chert mass is precisely measured, giving the total mass of the two stars of about 2.7 solar masses. We got an, a distance from the gravitational radiation that actually agreed with the distance observed of the kilonova that was associated with the supernova in the galaxy NGC uh, 4993. Um, this kilonova also suggested that there was considerable mass ejected from this um, merger that probably produced our process nuclei, which I don't have time to talk about. And from 
the uh, observations of the ejecta and from the gamma ray burst that accompanied this event. And here's the gamma ray burst that occurred 1.7 seconds later after the merger itself culminated. Uh, give us strong indications to believe that the maximum mass of neutron stars is less than about 2.2 solar masses. And finally, the tidal deformability measured uh, this binary deformability, lambda tilde, uh, was observed to be somewhat less than 600 um, to 90 percent confidence, and that, so that gives us an upper limit to neutron star radii, as I will, as I will mention. Now, GW170817 was a very typical expected merger uh, in the sense that there we know of 17 other uh, binary neutron star uh, systems in our own galaxy whose estimated uh, chirp masses are very close to the value observed for GW170817. So it was very typical. Now, the way we can measure radii from gravitational wave events is to look at tidal deformabilities. And if you compare the gravitational wave signal that's observed from a star with a small radius in blue or a large radius in purple, we find that as you get close to a merger that the signals um, begin to diverge from each other. And the phase difference uh, that's observed is directly proportional to the well-known chirp mass to the 5 thirds power and linearly proportional to the tidal deform binary tidal deformability. Now, the tidal deformability itself is the ratio of the induced dipole moment to the external dipole field. And interestingly, for all equations of state, it's going to depend on a very high power of the compactness. Now, it turns out that it's proportional to this dimensionless love number K2 and inversely proportional to the compactness GM over RC squared to the fifth power. The compactness itself in the range of Compactnesses, beta here is the is GM over RC squared, uh, varies inversely with the compactness. So in fact, lambda varies as the sixth power, inverse sixth power of the compactness. And for a binary, the binary deformability is a linear combination in terms of the mass ratios, uh, mass ratio of the system of the two deformabilities of the two stars. And it's observed, theoretically, we expect that lambda is proportional to the inverse sixth power of the, of the compactness. And in fact, for the range of masses of GW170817 between these two vertical dotted curves, we find that the, uh, that the, that the binary deformability uh, actually times beta to the sixth is in a very small, relatively small range. So this relationship immediately tells us since the, we know that the radii, no matter what the equation of state is, the radii of these stars between 1.1 1 .1 and 1 1.6 solar masses should be very close to each other, that the two deformabilities are simply proportional to the, uh, to the mass ratio to the sixth. The ratio of them is proportional to the mass ratio of the system to the sixth power. And using that information, the binary deformability can then be uh, uh, expressed in terms of the chert mass and the radii 1.4 solar masses, it turns out that this factor depending on Q is almost independent of Q completely. So we find a very simple relationship between the binary deformability, the chert mass, and the radii that goes like the sixth power. And so for example, for GW170817, one could predict the radii 1.4 solar masses from the measurement of the binary deformability and it's very weakly sensitive to the binary deformability. So an even even a very inaccurate measurement of the binary deformability gives us powerful estimates for the radii of 1.4 solar mass stars. So measurements uh, using gravitational waveform fitting have allowed us to determine the chert mass to pretty high precision, as shown here, and also the measurement of the binary deformability to much less accuracy. Um, so the range is between roughly say 80 and uh, seven or 800 as shown here to 90% confidence, the value is at least is less than about 650. And uh, there is systematic uncertainty in fitting the waveform models depending on whether you assume 
a, a depending on the prior that you assume for the binary deformability. And this is because as close as GW170817 was, um, it still uh, did not does not remove all effects of prior assumptions in waveform fitting. So if you assume models in which the deformabilities are treated as uniformly distributed, you find slightly larger radii than you do in models where you assume that the binary deformability is has a uniform has a prior that would give a uniform radius prior. And the fact is that since the lambda and r purport lambda is proportional to r to the sixth power, this can introduce about a kilometer difference in the estimated uh, radii of, of neutron stars. So there's still some systematic uncertainty in the waveform fitting. As I said, one can use the uh, observation of the fact that there was a kilonova together with the observed properties of the system from gravitational radiation to get a maximum mass inference that the maximum mass had to be less than about 2.2 uh, solar masses, which if true would be very interesting because if the minimum mass is 2.1 and the maximum maximum mass is 2.2, then we've already pinned down the maximum mass to quite some precision. I don't have time to go through the details of, of this, but since the slides are available, you can look at this more closely, or if there's questions about it, I can, I can go through that uh, very briefly. Um, the thing I want to finish with are the measurements that have been obtained using the nicer uh, Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer, which makes use of the fact that uh, when you observe a, a fluctuating source, such as would exist from hot spots on a neutron star that's rapidly rotating, um, the uh, relative flux that you observe depends extremely on the compactness of the neutron star. The more compact the neutron star is, the further behind the front of the neutron star that gravitational light bending will allow you to observe these spots. And so as a result, the relative flux uh, pattern uh, has a smaller amplitude than the case where the neutron star is large. There's also an energy dependence um, in the uh, in the these uh, different uh, flux profiles, uh, pulse profiles. And so that provides an independent measurement of masses and radii. And so the two together should give us the masses and radii um, together. And uh, very briefly, the result, there were two different teams in the NICER consortium that independently pursued the uh, observate the uh, data from Pulsar J0030 plus 0451. And their two results agreed with each other, uh, essentially. The Miller et al. group is, has a confidence intervals shown by the blue solid lines, and the uh, Amsterdam group, um, led by Anna Watts, uh, Riley et al. gave confidence intervals shown by the dotted red lines. And you can see that the inferred radii differ by a, a few tenths of a kilometer uh, in the two results. If we combine the nicer results together with the results from GW170817, we get um, a confidence region that decreases because of the increased amount of data, the fact that the two experiments are independent of each other. The overall result is that the predicted centroid, the mean value of the expected radius then of this star is a little bit less than 12 kilometers, which is perhaps to some people a little bit on the small side. And even at 90% confidence, the radius has to be less than about 13.3 uh, or 4, or, or four uh, kilometers and larger than um, about 10, uh, uh, 10, and a half, 10 and a half kilometers or so. So these two experiments, uh, gravitational radiation and uh, the NICER experiment, are able to um, um, pin down the radius to at the same sort of level that the nuclear systematics that we discussed also um, also suggested. So there's nice consistency at this level between nuclear experiments, nuclear theory, and uh, astrophysical observations. We look forward to nicer measurements of, of, of stars of greater masses to see if there's a systematic difference in radii between higher mass stars and lower mass stars, which would be indicative of a stiffening or a softening in the high density equation of state. And because the chirp masses of neutron stars um, maybe if given 
judging from the distribution observed in the galaxy, should be very similar to each other. So we should be able to stack those events and get more precise gravitational wave measurements. In the O3 gravitational wave observations from LIGO Virgo, uh, there were 39 mergers that were recently um, released in a catalog. 36 of them are binary black hole mergers, but three of them are the interesting events that could possibly contain neutron stars. GW190425 is either a binary neutron star with, an ex with very larger than expected masses or a black hole neutron star in which the neutron star is in the expected, more in the expected range and where the black hole is actually very, very small and very close to the expected neutron star maximum mass. So in either case, this system is, uh, is very interesting. Unfortunately, no more observations of the system are possible. And so we're left with this very mysterious um, uh, result. GW190426 was a likely black hole neutron star system with the black hole being around six solar masses and the neutron star um, around 1.4, 1.5 solar mass neutron stars. So again, we get a relatively small black hole with, together with a normal neutron star. GW190814 GW is either a, 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 a black hole neutron star um, or a binary black hole where the two components have quite a large mass ratio, 23 solar masses for the, ma for the largest star and around 2.6 solar masses for the smallest star. So this is interesting because if it's a binary black hole, we have again an example of a very low mass black hole. But if it's a black hole neutron star system, we have an extremely large neutron star mass above the expected maximum mass of, um, that, that we now think is, is, is reasonable. So 2.6 solar masses is not impossible from a theoretical perspective. It simply means that the equation of state must stiffen considerably, slightly above the nuclear saturation density where we have other information available. So again, simply from the fact that these three mergers uh, that have been observed so far containing a new, that possibly contain a neutron star, we have very interesting uh, results. Um, I can only imagine when we get up to hundreds of mergers what the situation is going to be like, and we're going to learn an off, uh, a lot. So I'll, I'll finish here and just summarize um, uh, that GW170817 was extremely important in giving us limits to the maximum mass of neutron stars and uh, conf confirming the radius information that we expected from, nuclei, from nuclear experiments. NICER provided additional uh, information, possibly suggesting slightly larger radii, but not inconsistent with what, what GW170817 would get. And uh, future gravitational wave measurements of binary neutron stars uh, will be additive, I think. And future NICER experiments will measure the radii of stars up to two solar masses. And so that those results should be very interesting as well. There is a slight tension between the most recent neutron skin measurements of lead and other nuclear experiments. And so uh, nuclear physics still has a long way to go to uh, firming up uh, uh, knowledge as well. So there are advances to be made in both nuclear physics and astrophysics um, in the near future that will be very profound concerning the you know, dense matter equation of state. So thank you for your attention and uh, be able to accept some questions now, I think. Thank you um, for a very nice overview of the uh, field, uh, how well we know the equation of star, uh, so equation of uh, state of neutron stars. Uh, questions? Okay, Ajit. Ajit. Sorry, yeah, yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, uh, that's a, um, a beautiful talk, Professor uh, Letterman. I uh, wanted to ask a question if there are any estimates for um, uh, dissipative processes in neutron star. In particular, I would like to know are there any estimates of the quality factor of the neutron star material? The, the quality factor? That for the various oscillation and vibration modes of the neutron star, which have been calculated. Uh, can one make an estimate of the quality factor of the, those modes? 
Yes, uh, I think the information we have concerning neutron star oscillations at this point is relatively weak. For, on the gravitational wave side, the uh, detectors did not have sensitivity to, at this distance, to high enough frequencies for us to observe any oscillations in the post-merger uh, remnant, which was expected to have survived for perhaps a tenth of a second or, or so. And uh, the other measurements of neutron star oscillations uh, information that we have come from X-ray observations, uh, post-burst behavior, for example. Um, I think there's tremendous theoretical complications involving how much the core and the crust are coupled in, in this situation. And uh, so I think, uh, uh, no, I, I don't think that the measurement of oscillation so far has given us uh, very profound information, but it certainly uh, worth pursuing in the future uh, as if the measure as the measurements can become uh, more more precise. I don't know if this answers your question or not. That's fine. I mean, I wanted to know if there are any theoretical estimates. You think even theoretical estimates are not there for neutron star interior material, core material? I think the theoretical estimates still have the uncertainties connected with core crust coupling okay. that um, can be can can skew their results. Uh, quite a bit at present. So I don't think we can be that comfortable with that. Actually, Luciano is more of an expert, um, I think, concerning oscillation modes in, um, in neutron stars than I am. So maybe he has something he could add to at this point. Tiana, did you want to add anything? Um, well, just to, to say that I agree with, with uh with Jim. Um, the, the problem is that, you know, if you want to calculate the uh, quality factor, you have to take into account all the dissipative, um, you know, processes that can, can intervene. And uh, one of them has got to do with just the, the structure, but then you also have gravitational wave emission. And the latter depends very much on the type of perturbations. If your perturbations are, you know, very spherical, then the, the efficiency of emission is very small. On the other hand, if you have very non-spherical perturbations and very uh, highly non-linear, the efficiency of emission changes completely. So I think, it, um, you know, differently from standard material, uh, determining the quality factor of a neutron star is, is not trivial. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we move to Dr. Arvind Kumar? Uh, hi. Actually, I have uh, one query related to the mass radius relationship curves. If we look into the mass radius curve of the neutron star, uh, yeah, here. So if we look into the mass radius of the neutron star, they start from the right, then go up uh, in the upside. But uh, for the strange quark matter, they start from the left. So why for the pure strange quark matter? So why these two curves are so different? Yeah, um, so, so what's the question? Uh, means on the green curve, which are for the pure strange quark matter, they yes. start from the left side and then go upwards. Whereas for the pure neutron star, they start from the uh, right side, then go in the up, upward direction. That's right. So the strange quark stars are these theoretical constructs which do not have a crust. And yeah. I think that the their existence is so far completely unproven. Um, all, uh, all observations of neutron stars that we have, for example, as pulsars or as X-ray emitting objects, and with the exception of gravi the gravitational wave candidates, um, all these other observations based on X-rays, I think require the existence of a crust to produce um, th this, the, the, the observed uh, phenomena, especially the, the pulsing phenomena. Okay. So, at this point, I think there's absolutely no um, astrophysical evidence for the existence of strange quark matter stars. But of course, by the same token, we have no uh, no significant evidence that they don't exist. So if you take the Occam razor perspective, then this would suggest that strange quark matter stars are highly unlikely, which is my perspective. But I don't want, you know, I wouldn't. You, you certainly can't exclude the possibility that that some strange quark matter stars do exist. 
I like I like the argument that's based on Kurt Vonnegut's short story Ice Nine. That would suggest that strange quark matter stars do not exist. If you remember the story, Ice Nine is a form of ice that a chemist discovered that is more stable than normal ice. This escaped from the laboratory and slowly all the ice in the world converted to the strange form of ice, which essentially destroyed civilization. And in a similar way, if there was a population of strange quark matter stars, we would have neutron star mergers involving them. We have good reason to believe that in the case of some black hole neutron star mergers and all neutron star mergers that matter is ejected, you would eject the strange quark matter stars, the strange quark matter, which would then pollute the universe, get captured into normal stars and convert them into strange quark stars. And we would not be observing any normal stars. And the fact that I think we do see normal stars to me suggests that strange quark matter stars may not exist from uh, okay. Okay. that argument. Thanks. Uh, um, Hiran Mayer? Hiran Mayer, Yeah, my question is uh, this uh, gravitational wave constraints of mass and radius has it uh, has also the possibility of having a phase transition inside the core of neutron stars to quark matter I, in, in one of its states like superconducting, color superconducting or quark ionic or whatever it is? Yes, as, 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 this, as this slide was meant to illustrate, once you get above a few times the nuclear saturation density, um, we have no definitive information at present um, concerning what is going on. And it, in particular, your question about whether a phase transition to quark matter exists is extremely important. And um, theoretically, it's expected that at some density, matter exists in the form of deconfined quarks um, um, at densities of 40 or 50 times the saturation density, lattice QCD. Uh, suggests that that is the ground state of matter. Um, but there's a tremendous extrapolation between those densities and, and neutron star matter densities. Um, in any case, there are reasons to believe from the relative smallness of the radii of neutron stars as estimated from GW170817 so far that um, the equation of state is stiffening above the saturation density and that could be well caused by a phase transition. Uh, normally we think that phase transitions cause a softening in the equation of state, but it's possible if the quark matter appears in a quark ionic form that the speed of sound could actually increase uh, briefly for a small range of densities very close to the speed of light. This causes a large stiffening in the equation of state which would produce a large, both a large maximum mass and a relatively small radius. So, um, as I say, there's no definitive um, observations yet for or exist the existence of this phase transition or its properties. And so that's an extremely important question going forward. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, uh, sorry, one, you wanted to follow up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, does it also, I mean, the hyperon matter can be, can also be, can be rolled out or rolled in? I mean, do you want to comment? We can, if the hyperon, if the hyperon, hyperon, and hyperon nucleon couplings are attractive, we can basically rule out the existence of hyperons in uh, in neutron stars because the equation of state would simply be too soft to support the mac the masses that we observe. However, if the hyperon couplings are repulsive then absolutely hyperons could exist. But in that situation, since the, since the interactions are repulsive, the population of, of hyperons will be, end up being quite small on the order of 10% or less. So they would wow. represent a fairly minor contribution to the equation of state at, at high density. So I think at present, the existence of two solar mass neutron stars informs us that the hyperon, hyperon and or hyperon nucleon couplings are are um, are not attractive, 
and uh, are perhaps repulsive. And uh, so we can't rule out the existence of hyperons in dense matter, but uh, we can, I think, rule out large populations of them. So they could exist at the few percent level and could be very important as a consequence in terms of cooling, because even a few percent of lambdas, for example, mm -hmm. could uh, lead to a direct Urca-like process of rapid neutrino cooling and would cool um, perhaps high mass neutron stars um, much faster than, than, than lower mass neutron stars. So I think thermal observations of neutron stars may inform us about the uh, dense, about some of the dense properties of matter um, uh, simultaneously with perhaps measurements of post-merger um, remnants in gravitational wave events um, as, as well. So I think, you know, combining the physics, the observations from these different perspectives could be very, very enlightening. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Can we have a quick question from Pradeep Sahu? And uh, I think that's all we have time for now. Hello. So I have just a very brief question about that. Uh, you talked about the mass radius relation. So you have considered a lot of theory as well, but uh, nowhere actually you consider the magnetic field effect. So I think the magnetic field effect also uh, affects the mass and radius because we, uh, with magnetic field, this, uh, because we see in the surface magnetic field is very high. So that effect should be there, the question one. Question two, I'll just briefly, about nicer experiment, experiment, observation, what you say that, that the small black holes. So are you not confusing the black holes with the Newton star mass? So these two questions. Okay, so the first question concerned uh, magnetic field effects on neutron stars. I, th I think um, that to get a pronounced effect for the structure of the star, in other words, to influence the mass radius curve, that the magnetic field in the interior of the star has to uh, approach 10 to the 17th Gauss. Uh, we certainly don't have evidence of that for many known pulsars, that the field is anywhere close to that, those values um, near the center. Um, there's certainly a limit to how high these central fields can be compared to the surface fields. Um, calculations I've done in the past suggest that that ratio is probably no more than three or so, and Luciano has, again, um, done magnetohydrodynamic studies um, and has investigated that ratio as before. I once posed Luciano a, a question that he hasn't yet answered um, that we tried to address, which is the actually, what is the largest dipole, magnetic dipole moment or the largest mag central magnetic field strength that can exist inside of a neutron star without destabilizing it? And our calculation suggested it was a few times 10 to the 17th, considerably less than the uh, virial uh, limit of about 10 to the 18th Gauss. But that's still an open question. Um, in merging neutron stars, the magnetic field could easily, um, I think, achieve values where it's going to influence the structure of the, uh, of the, of the compact remnant, at least temporarily. On the other hand, with such large magnetic fields, I think that they will be rapidly dissipated as well because of the differential rotation that exists in those configurations. Um, the second, let's see, remind what was the second question again? That uh, in the nicer observation, so you said that uh, there is a small black holes observation and the pulsar coming from Newton star and uh, also black holes. So are you not confusing that which well, one? No, no, these weren't. Well, oh, maybe I misspoke, but but the nicer results so far concerns a roughly 1.4 solar mass star. And the future measurements of nicer will concern masses up to two. Right now, we're almost finished with the analysis of a two point of the 2.1 solar mass um, star. That 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 information should be published in another few months, we hope. Um, and uh, so that will be very interesting to compare the radii of those events. But um, I, I think the, and the gravitational wave measurements suggest the existence of very low mass uh, black holes, or in the one case of extremely large neutron star. 
um, but, but 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 again, um, in, in in that case of a very large neutron star, you can equally well explain the data statistically by suggesting it's a it's a very low mass uh, black hole. Um, stellar evolution modelers give no indication that there should be a gap between the maximum mass of a neutron star and some lower limit for black hole masses. Um, so this mass gap that the LIGO-Virgo consortium discusses is kind of an artifice of the current observations that for which we don't have any observations of, neutron, of black holes in the range of two and a half to five or, or six solar masses. But um, I think that's art, an artificial construct um, as uh, stellar evolution models of, of supernovae do not suggest that such a gap exists in, in practice. So I don't know if that answers your, your question, but I didn't mean to suggest that NICER was suggesting the existence of extremely small neutron star masses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this brings us to the close of the session. Before I close, I wanted to point out Luciano has in the chat box given a couple of references answering what uh, Rosa Latimer uh, posed a few minutes back. Uh, so maybe you should just copy them onto wherever you want. Uh, and uh, so let me wrap up the session, the plenary session on particle astrophysics and cosmology, uh, thanking all the three speakers, Pascual Sapico, uh, Luciano, and uh, uh, Professor Latimer. And uh, uh, we hope to see you soon. And uh, does Bidanga has anything to announce? Uh, I think we can. No, thank, thanks to the speaker and thanks to you, Tarun, for conducting this session. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Luciano, for the response. <laughs> no, not, not at all. I thought, yeah, I hope this, this is what you were asking. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Uh, good evening, everybody. And... Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank Bye. you.